Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, this early on a Thursday. Um, it's a true pleasure to introduce Professor Jorge Moreno, uh, who I've gotten to know um, as part of my research here at Caltech. I work with Professor Phil Hopkins, and um, Professor Moreno is often visiting our group and um, sharing his research with us, and I've gotten to interact with him at a variety of other conferences where he shares not only his research, but his passion for getting um, everyone the opportunity to be able to uh, be involved in such interesting research discovering the secrets of the universe. Uh, Professor Jorge Moreno is a theoretical astrophysicist. His area of expertise is galaxy formation theory. He's just begun his appointment as an assistant professor of astronomy at Pomona College this July. Um, his work has received a huge amount of recognition in the field, as I mentioned. Um, many invited colloquia, conference talks, contributed conference talks. Uh, he wants to come to our speeches next week, but he's going to be in Boston and then Sydney, traveling all over the world, sharing his research. Um, he is currently serving as the chair of the AAAS Committee on the Status of Minorities in Astronomy and has taken the time out of his busy schedule to join us here at Caltech today. So without further ado, Professor Moreno, thank you. Thank you for a nice introduction. Can you hear me? So just before I start, just a show of hands, which of you are students in, in Summer Up? Okay, so this talk is for you. So if you have any questions or, any, or something doesn't make sense, feel free to stop me. Uh, today I'll talk about galaxy interactions. My field is studying galaxies. And when I was a kid, I really liked smashing things together. So now as a grown-up, I smash galaxies together. But these aren't real galaxies. These are galaxies that live in a supercomputer. I'm also the chair of the Committee on the Status of Minorities in Astronomy. My charge is to represent, advocate, and fight for all astronomers of color in the United States. So on the second part of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about that. And uh, let me just get started. And before I get started, I, wanna, I want to recognize the Hahamonga people. We are on occupied land, and I want to recognize that these were the first inhabitants of this land. So galaxies. Galaxies come in many shapes, sizes, and colors. And if you look at this picture, probably you can start recognizing patterns. So let me ask the students, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you see this picture? Imagine your job is to classify these galaxies. What is the first thing you see, you, the first trend you notice? Oh, so you probably know more about this than me, which is great. So those, does anybody want to volunteer? I guess like if they're in a spiral or So she's saying if there are spiral or elliptical galaxies. So if you look at a galaxy like this one or this one, they look like tiny spirals. Whereas if you look at like uh, galaxies like this one, it looks like an elliptical. It looks like a football or a rugby ball. So shape or what we say in the field morphology, is a way to classify galaxies. What else do you guys see? Colors, colors right? So what do you see about colors? Um, there's some that are like really light, and some that are blue, and then there's some that are like gold. Yeah, some look golden, and some look blue, right? And actually, astronomers, for some reason, the ones that look golden, we call them red galaxies, even though they are kind of like orangey. So we see, it seems that both morphology or shape and color plays a role. What's that? That is, a, that is actually a good uh, thing to guess. But all these galaxies, and this is something I didn't tell you, are in the local universe. So they're all at the same redshift, more or less. But definitely the redshift does play a role. So if it's not redshift, it, sh it could be something else. Mm -hmm. So it could be, so you might, wanna, you might wonder, well, Mm-hmm. So, uh, let's see. So, where were we? So, do you see any trends, any connections between the shape of galaxies and their color? Just by looking at this picture. Huh. And I'd like, to, I'd like to hear from people who haven't spoken. Do you see any blue ellipticals? No, right? If you're looking for blue galaxies, they all tend to be spirals. What about the reverse? Do you see any 
blue spirals. <coughs> blue spirals. Most of the spirals are blue, right? Like this one, this one, this one. What about red spirals? Do you see any red spirals? Well, and when I say red, I mean golden looking. You look at this one, or this one, even though they look like spirals, they're becoming redder. So what we know about this is uh, when a galaxy is blue, it means that it's making a lot of stars. It has a lot of gas that gas turns into stars, which manifests itself in massive stars, which are blue. Whereas these ones, the ones that look reddish, they're not making any stars, they're old. Their stars are old and they're dying. So for many years, astronomers have been trying to come up with a picture to uh, understand this connection between the shape of galaxies and their colors. And one of the pictures that has won a lot of attention is galaxy mergers. So the idea is if you take two spiral galaxies that are full of gas, making tons of stars and they're blue, and you merge them, eventually you get an elliptical galaxy. And it turns out that the Milky Way and Andromeda are in a collision course. And in a few billion years, you're going to take these two spiral galaxies and create an elliptical galaxy. Some people call that Milkomeda. And if we were to live that long, this is probably what the sky would look like. We would see Andromeda getting closer and closer and closer, and eventually we end up in an elliptical galaxy. So the kind of quest science question I'm trying to answer in my field as a scientist is, do interactions leave any imprints of galaxies? If I look at a galaxy, can I know, by looking at its structure, can I know anything about its interaction history? It's kind of, it, the same applies for people. For example, if you see me smiling, it probably means that I just had breakfast with my wife, and I love her, and every time I'm with her, I get super happy. So by looking at my big smiles, you can probably guess that I, was, that I just had an interaction with my wife. So that's kind of like the, the analogy I'm trying to do here with galaxies. By looking at a galaxy, can we, do we know if it had a, a close interaction? <coughs> One example I like is Messier 82. If we look at Messier 82 and we zoom in, we see that there is a lot of star formation in the center. And when you have a lot of star formation, because you're producing a lot of energy, that creates winds. So all these new stars are sending a lot of radiation that is pushing a lot of wind out. So when you see a lot of winds, this is a sign that there is a starburst going on. So what I'm trying to, one question I would like to, one, one thing I would like to know is, well, it has a companion, Messier 82. I would like to know if Messier 82 had anything to do with the fact that Messier 82, 81, 82, is having a starburst and outflows. If this galaxy kind of messed with this one, it shook it, so that would start making lots of stars and creating outflows. That is the kind of questions I'm trying to answer. And to do that, I use simulations. So how do you create a fake galaxy? You need a supercomputer. This is to be, and people here at Caltech will use that a lot. You need a supercomputer, and you need a lot of code. And I hear you all have been coding all summer. And this is a kind of a sample of my code. And it looks kind of boring, but for me, this is like, this is the best of my, part of my day when I'm coding. It's like I'm solving mysteries. I feel like Scooby-Doo. And I get up in the morning, and the first thing that comes to mind is I want to get to the office so I can code, because last night I was running something that wasn't quite working, and I have to know the answer. So even though scientists get all this glory of presenting their science, at least from my point of view, the best part of being a scientist is actually doing the grunt work, that late night or early morning where I'm just typing and coding and being really excited. So let me ask you a quiz, because you guys are students. I'm showing you a bunch of real galaxies, and there is one fake galaxy. Can somebody guess which one is the fake galaxy? Somebody who hasn't spoken? Do you want to guess? Uh, I think it's the yellow one on the right. Like this ugly one here? Uh. <laughs> well, that is a fake galaxy, but it turns out that all of these are fake galaxies. Except that this is from the competition. They're not really good. But we are people who work with fire. With these uh, kind of simulations, we can create galaxies that look a lot like real galaxies. But unlike real galaxies, which take millions of years to merge, fake galaxies only take a few seconds to merge. And this is a, this is a simulation, this is a movie of those virtual galaxies merging, as they would look to someone with a telescope. So I'm showing you the stars, and you see dust, and you see uh, 
Sometimes if you have a good eye, you might see blue dots, which are starts going supernova. You have the two galaxies, they have a first passage, they separate, they merge, and eventually this will become an elliptical galaxy. We believe that Andromeda and the Milky Way will be something like this. So now, before I was saying, well, one of my goals in science is to see if, yes? So the outputs of the simulation can create a movie that runs in a few seconds. Yeah. The actual simulation itself, it depends on how many com cores you use. For example, sometimes I use a thousand cores and that takes a couple of days to run. But in reality, this would take billions of years. So the, going back to the question, do, can simulations tell us something about the uh, imprints of past interactions? So here's another movie, and here I'm showing the gas. So before I was showing the stars, now I'm showing the gas, like hydrogen and helium, which is the fuel of star formation. When you have uh, two galaxies, these two galaxies are spinning in the same direction. And when that happens, they, you create a bridge, you create these beautiful tails. And if you look at this little one, and I guess, uh, let me rewind that again. I want you to focus on, the, on this guy for a moment. So they come close together, they separate, you create this bridge, you create these tails, and you, if you look at this one, there are things coming out. It's like it's farting or spitting. <laughs> like this tiny galaxy is like spitting out gas. And before I was telling you about Messier 81 with these outflows, that's what's happening here. The little galaxy is making a lot of stars, which is launching a lot of winds. These two galaxies are spinning in the same way. We call that a prograde merger. It turns out that if you have a retrograde merger when the two galaxies are spinning in opposite ways, the kind of things you get are different. So these are the same galaxies except that they are rotating in different directions. And you don't see those parts. You see tails, but they are really small. And, and I'm not showing this here, but you also don't see a lot of star formation. So it seems that by looking at the kind of galaxy you have, you can not only say whether or not it had a close interaction, but also what kind of interaction you had. So if I have a if I have brunch with my wife, you will probably see me smiling. But if I have brunch with my worst enemy, I will probably not be smiling. Just by looking at my structure, you can tell not not if not only of not if I had an interaction, but what kind of interaction I had. So just to recap. Prograde interactions, they produce large tails, star formation, and these farts, these outflows. Whereas retrograde interactions, they, don't, they produce very small tails, little star formation, and weak or no outflows. Uh, 